Okay, so welcome everyone to our third uh, meeting of the half pay colloquia series for this fall 2020. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have here with us uh, Patrick Engish, who is uh, a co founder of Culinary Mind and a member of Culinary Mind. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher uh, at the University of Luzerne. And um, today he's going to talk uh, to us about modeling culinary values uh, or culinary value. Uh, he prepared the handout, which I'm going to share now in the chat. I'm going to share a link in the chat uh, from which you can uh, retrieve the handout. As we did also for the previous meeting, if you have uh, any questions while Patrick is uh, giving his talk, you can write them in chat and then he can decide whether to address them while he's speaking or uh, uh, whether to address them at the end of his talk. And at the end of the talk, we'll do a break, just very short break, uh, you know, two, three minutes, five minutes, and then we will have uh, Q&A. Patrick, you have the floor, thanks. Thanks a lot. So I hope everybody has a, has a handout. And uh, well, the handout is very long. It's not exactly a handout because what I thought is that I would neither uh, you know, have slides because if you just have slides on the screen and you never see me, it's pretty boring. And if I just read the paper, it's even more boring. And if I just do it freestyle, then God knows what's gonna happen. So I think I'm gonna, if we all follow the, the, the handout together, that should be, that should be uh, good enough. Okay, so let me just start with a very small introduction and sort of tell you the pitch of the paper, which is actually very um, straightforward. The idea is that there are uh, culinary products, namely things that can be eaten or drunk, basically anything that, that can be eaten or drunk. And the idea is these uh, things that have values of different kinds. And there's one kind of value they have, which is their value qua culinary products. And this is what I'm going to call the culinary value. And what I want to do is discuss three models of uh, culinary value and reject two of them and endorse uh, a third one. So just give you a little preview. Uh, there's going to be five sections, including this introductory one. In the next section, I'm going to uh, clarify a bit the distinction between that central to the talk between constitutive values and adventitious values. I'm going to present the first uh, model of culinary value, which I call the hedonic model. I'm going to reject it, move on to what I call the cognitively enhanced model of culinary value. I'm going to reject it. Then I'm going to give you a, a, a sort of a, 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 re a sort of section where I give a general argument why I think we should reject these two models and any models that have some kind of basic commitment that they share. And then I'm going to offer a third uh, model, which I call, I call the encompassing model of culinary value. Okay, so I start with the, the second section and I start with a very uh, general claim, which is the following. Um, I'm just going to read this because it's slightly complex. Well, complex, not complex, but slightly uh, a lot of variables. So it's easier if I read. With respect to an item A of a kind K to which we attribute a set of values S, we can distinguish within S, this set of values, between two kinds of values. On the one hand, what we might call constitutive values, and the other hand, what we might call adventitious values. And a value V of an item E of a kind K counts as constitutive if and only if V is a value that bears on the evaluation of I qua K. On the other hand, a value of V of an item I counts as adventitious if and only if V is a value that does not bear on the evaluation of I qua K. Okay, so this is uh, a bit abstract. So I'm going to give you some examples and I'm sorry if you can hear some cats around, but they will be cats. There's no way I can have them outside, but uh, hopefully they won't be too much of a nuisance. Okay, so let me give you some examples. Take a moral action whatever moral action, and this moral action can have several values. And among them, it can have a value as a moral action, moral value, and can have other uh, values. For instance, you do the right thing, and that, you know, this, this action has moral value, 
but also it makes you feel good. And this has some kind of psychological value. And we want to say that the psychological value is not part of the moral value of the action. Still, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a value that bears on this action. Or you can have a case of an artwork. You know, artworks, they have artistic value. They also have investment value. And you want to say, well, uh, whatever value they have as an artistic value is the constitutive value. Values they have like investment value. These are adventitious values that these objects can have. And then you can have something which is called overall value of these objects, which is the sum of their constitutive value and their different adventitious values. Okay. Now, the canary domain is, is one of the values. I think that should be uh, quite obvious. Why? Because different canary products can be deemed uh, to sustain life. So they have kind of, you know, biological value to really hunger, to taste good, to be healthy, to be authentic, to be creative or innovative be harm-free, to be sustainable, to be nostalgia-inducing, so on and so forth. There's really a great range of values of very different kinds that these uh, canary objects can bear. And here is the question I'm going to address. It's which among all these kind of values that canary objects can have can be concerned with the, the canary value of a canary, a canary product? Which of them can be determiners or which properties that determine these different values can be determiners also of culinary value. Okay, so I hope this is quite clear and I'm going to start uh, right away with the first uh, model of culinary value, which I call the hedonic model of culinary value. I think it's the simplest model and I think it's also, you know, de facto anyone's model of culinary value when you start to think about this, that's, that's where you start. And I'm going to try to show you that Actually, it's not a very, it's not a very good model. So here is the first pass at the hedonic model of Connery value. Uh, that's point three point one on the handout. The Connery value of a Connery product is a function of the fact that it is both uh, nutritious and conducive to some kind of hedonic consumption experience, consumption that, uh, 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 consumption experience that has some kind of pleasant aspect to it. Let me introduce some terminology in order to make a more precise uh, 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 version of this, of this model. So I'm going to, give, uh, to go through these, these different uh, uh, terminological uh, uh, issues there that's from A to, to E. So let me define first a nutritional property of a canary product as being a property that contributes to the maintaining of the nutritional uh, equilibrium that's necessary for life. Very straightforward. Then let me define a consumable property of a uh, culinary product as one that's conducive to a consumption experience with a hedonic component, whether pleasure or displeasure. I'm going in a bit to distinguish between uh, two kinds of, of consumption uh, consumable properties, but just bear in mind with this very general uh, uh, now, trivially, a, consu a consumption experience is an experience that results from acquaintance with consumable properties, and I should say actually acquaintance and possibly discrimination of these consumable properties. Now, let me make this distinction between two kinds of consumable properties, what I call discriminative consumable properties and what I call non-discriminable uh, uh, consumable properties. So a discriminative consumable property of a culinary product is one that is discriminated in the experience such that it's gustatory or olfactory properties. So you taste a bit of, uh, a bit of cake and you say, oh, it tastes like uh, lemon. Well, as part of the experience, you can discriminate its consumable property of tasting like lemon. Now, I think it's very important to distinguish consumable properties in that sense from consumable properties in another sense, namely non-discriminative consumable properties, which are properties of canary products that do impact the experience, the phenomenal character of the experience, but in a way that don't entail that we discriminate them in the experience. So think, for instance, of the phenomenal state of hunger, not its biological uh, subconscious counterpart, but the, 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 the phenomenal character of hunger. And think of how eating something can relieve you from this phenomenal character of hunger. This is going to be a, a property on my terminology of the canary product, 
it being able to relieve you from hunger. And it's going to be a consumable property of it, but not one that's being uh, discriminated. You don't discriminate the property of re uh, being, being, having the power to relieve from hunger in the experiments. You just feel it. Okay. Now, of course, there is definitely some relation between our valuing uh, culinary products, qua culinary products, and they having uh, nutritional and consumable properties in the sense uh, in the senses defined here. For instance, we, va we value frozen pizza and we value Gruyere cheese because of the nutritional and consumable properties. There's no doubt about this. And it seems also true to say that we attribute more culinary value to Gruyere cheese than to frozen pizza because Gruyere's processing floral and salty consumable properties is conducive to some kind of experience of, of consumption experience that's more pleasant than the one of eating a greasy and bland frozen pizza. And here's the quick question is, is now what exactly is the relation between a culinary product having such nutritious, nutritional, sorry, and consumable properties and it's having culinary value. And here is uh, the answer that's being given by the hedonic model of culinary value. They say the culinary value of a culinary product is entirely determined by its nutritional and consumable properties. Now, here we need to be very careful, I think, to really understand well the logical space of culinary value, because we have to see that there is actually two different claims to which uh, the hedonic model is committed to when he says something like this, or when he says something like this, we want in the spirit of the hedonic model. So on uh, point three, point six, uh, I, I make this distinction between two claims, C1 and C2. The first claim is that the sole determiners of culinary value are nutritional and consumable properties. But there's another claim here, which is important for the hedonic model, which is C2, which is to say that the valuable aspects of consumable properties are exhausted by the power to determine the hedonic components of a consumption experience. The fact that, for instance, it can relieve you from hunger and cause a pleasant uh, experience of tasting strawberry. Now, uh, as a result of C1, the reasons for which a canary product can be said to possess canary value, whether it is a positive or a negative one, rests on its power to maintain nutritional equilibrium and to be conducive to hedonic, non discriminative, and discriminative consumption experiences. So here it's important to see that this is a claim about the metaphysical basis of culinary value. It's, uh, it's a claim about the fact that these metaphysical basis is restricted to nutritional and consumable properties. Now, C2, so as a result of C2, there's a, a further restriction, which is a restriction on the way the consumable properties, properties sorry, can be said to play a role in determining culinary, culinary value. So the only way they can determine culinary value is by being conducive to some kind of hedonic feeling. So this is not a, a metaphysic claim per se. This is a claim, if you want, about what this metaphysical basis can determine. Or, or if you want, it's a further metaphysical claim, which is distant from the first one. It says that consumption experiences are to be evaluated, if at all, only in purely hedonic terms, and this is to be the ones that are going to be relevant to determine culinary value. So here you have a sort of final formulation of this hedonic model. The culinary value of a culinary product is a function of the way its nutritional and consumable properties, whether discriminative or non-discriminative, can be conducive to the maintaining of our nutritional equilibrium and to our undergoing consumption experiences that are understood purely in hedonic terms. Okay, now there's one problem, rather small with this model, is that it's mistaken. And uh, why? Well, I'm going to uh, 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 claim that this hedonic uh, model is actually uh, 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 making a confusion be between two different things, between what I'm going to call consumption value on the one hand, and what I'm going to call culinary value. And the way I'm going to introduce this distinction between consumption value and culinary value 
is by means of the following thought experiment, you could imagine that you have qualitative, qualitatively indistinguishable pieces of cheese. So for instance, uh, a piece of authentic Gruyere and a piece of cheese that's a complete qualitative uh, 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 replica or counterpart of this piece of cheese, but has been entirely sourced from a lab. And the idea is that these two pieces of cheese, they're going to share all their uh, nutritional properties and their consumable properties. You will have exactly the same kind of nutritious effect and exactly the same kind of uh, consumption experience to be captured in any terms, whether you eat one or the other. But the, uh, by assumption, here we want to say, well, it's not the case that the, the two have the same culinary value, of course. The one that source from the lab, you know, let me grant this assumption, has less culinary value than the authentic one. And, and the problem uh, uh, is that uh, the hedonic model is not really able to, to, to account for this distinction between the value, the culinary value of these two pieces of cheese, hence uh, it cannot be the right one. And here the hidden, the hidden assumption is that any model that's not able to mark this distinction is going to be one that is missing something important about the nature of culinary values. Okay, so let me move on now to, to the second model of, of culinary value, uh, which I call the cognitively enhanced model of culinary value, which is if you want a kind of extension of the hedonic model, but conceived in a way that it can account for the distinction between consumption value and uh, culinary value. So here is a preview of the, the, the cognitive enhanced model. It endorses the above claim C1, but it rejects the claim C2, especially the fact that the only uh, way that these uh, properties can, can determine uh, 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 the consumption experience is, is in a purely hedonic way. And uh, it's going to, to, to use this to be able to distinguish between uh, consumption value and genuine culinary value. So here is, if you want, the sort of general claim that's beyond, uh, behind, sorry, uh, this cognitively enhanced model. That's uh, uh, 4.2 on the handout. So I'm just going to read this, this bit so we have a good and, and clear uh, understanding of this. So culinary products are consumables by nature. That's the sort of general idea that drives these this two models. And the valuable properties qua uh, canary products must therefore be a function uh, of features of them that are strictly related to their consumption, namely their nutritional and their consumable properties. That's the sort of basic claim that these two models are going to share. However, the second model claims it is a mistake to claim further that the valuable aspects of consumable properties are exhausted by the power to determine the hedonic components of a consumption experience. There is more, if you want, to the value of the consumption experience than pleasure and displeasure. And this I, I, I take to be a view which is well argued by Cain Todd in his book, the, the Philosophy of Want. And basically what I'm going to argue, if you want, is that Cain is on the right track, but not completely. Before, uh, before going to uh, discuss in details this account, let me just flag a dead hand here because someone could say, uh, what is actually missing in the hedonic model is the notion of aesthetic experience. And once you have something like this, the notion of aesthetic experience and aesthetic attention, then you can distinguish between uh, consumption value and culinary value. And uh, well, it really depends a bit on your notion of aesthetic experience, but you have a, a notion of aesthetic experience that's, that's uh, uh, light enough, then it's not going to work. Why? Because all the properties to which you can uh, uh, turn your aesthetic attention are going to be shared by the two pieces of cheese. So you, cannot, you won't be able to, to use that notion of aesthetic experience or aesthetic attention to, to make sense of this distinction. Unless you do what the model the, the, the second model is not going to do. So it's just to flag a dead end and move on to this uh, uh, second model. So the, the better way to go here is to operate a conceptual distinction between two things, what I call consumable properties in a strict sense, 
and what I call consumable properties in an extended sense. And the idea is that, uh, just to give you the preview, uh, consumable properties in a strict sense are, are consumable properties that are merely sensorily uh, 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 experienced and discriminated. And consumable properties in an extended sense are these properties, however, as they are the object of an experience that is cognitively penetrated. So let me give you a, a sort of standard example of cognitive penetration and of the role that concepts can play, for instance, in the case of visual experience, and then I'm going to, up, uh, to apply this in the case of kinetic experience. So the sort of, sort of standard example is imagine you have two uh, people that are looking uh, at a blue jay uh, uh, standing on a, on, a, on a branch from exactly the same uh, perspective. And uh, the problem is that one person does possess the concept of blue jay, the other one does not. And we want to say that in some sense, these two people have the same experience because they have the same, they are affected by the same sensory patterns. It's exactly the same object in the same colors and blah, blah, blah. So they are affected by the same uh, uh, sensory patterns. They have the same purely sensory experience. But we, cannot, we also want to say that the person who has the concept blue jay, blue jay sorry, has a different experience. Why? Because she's, a, she's experiencing that uh, bird as a blue jay. And this somewhat you know, affects the nature of her experience. And it also affects something which is important is that this person can know correctly or incorrectly experience the blue jay as a blue jay. That's really something that's being given by the possession of the concept. Okay, now the claim is that, the claim I'm going to defend is that uh, uh, in the case of consumption experience of culinary products, we can distinguish between experiences that are purely sensory and experiences that are cognitively penetrated, and that uh, we can uh, uh, distinguish between consumption value and, and, uh, and culinary value in terms of this distinction. So the claim is that consumption value is determined entirely by consumable properties in a strict sense, while canary value is or can be, here I'm gonna leave that open because it's not always the case that in order to grasp the canary value, you, you would have to, to have cognitive penetration, but at least when you need to make the distinction between consumption value and canary value, you can rely on cognitive penetration. So current value is or can be determined by consumable properties in an extended sense. Namely, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, you, you have, you taste uh, some kind of product in the light of some concept you possess. So I'm going to give you an example just to clarify this, but let me just say before doing this that proceeding that way has a very nice feature because uh, it will give us the possibility to distinguish between consumption and, and culinary value without adding more to the metaphysical basis of the model than only nutritional properties and consumable properties. So in that respect, it's a very uncostly uh, move we make. So let me give you an example. Uh, um, well, you have these two uh, pieces of cheeses that I, I discussed before that are qualitatively indistinguishable, but one of them is authentic, the other one is not. And well, the person who has the concept authentic Gruyere cheese can taste correctly the authentic piece of cheese as an authentic piece of Gruyere cheese and can be said thereby to access more features than purely sensory ones. Because you can say, oh, I know that in the light of when I, when I taste the piece of cheese in the light of that concept, I can access features of it like it being connected to the, a certain kind of terroir and its flavor being an expression of that terroir. And I can identify its taste as being the expression of an intention of a cheese meal. And these are things you can correctly attribute in the light of tasting the piece of cheese as that piece of cheese. Now you could do the same thing with respect to the lab produced piece of cheese. You could experience it as a lab, as a lab produced piece of cheese correctly. And there, for instance, you know, taste uh, 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 its terroir, if you want, the, the, the fact that it was produced in that, in that lab environment, as well as the intentions of the people who produced the cheese, basically to reduplicate 
this taste of the authentic. And then you're going, to, you're going to say, well, the way these consumable, uh, sorry, the way these, these consumable properties in an extended sense are being experienced in the two cases sort of give you a good ground to say that one has more culinary value than the other. The authentic piece of cheese has more culinary value than the other because it's, 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 it's uh, uh, consumable properties in an extended sense are somewhat more interesting than in the case of the lab uh, piece of cheese. Okay. Um, let me uh, uh, give you sort of an official formulation of this second model. It's for it's point four eleven on the handout. The uh, sorry, the consumption value of a culinary uh, product is a function of its nutritional and consumable properties in a strict sense alone. While the culinary value of a culinary product can be determined by its consumable properties in an extended sense. Okay, this second model is appealing. Why? Because it allows to distinguish between consumption value and culinary value. And in terms of that distinction, we could, for instance, distinguish between the culinary value of the lab piece of cheese and the authentic piece of cheese. And it can make room, generally speaking, for uh, consumption experience as a kind of thoughtful enterprise, where when you taste something, when you consume something with the right concepts, you can look for the right things somehow. And it does all of this without uh, uh, adding much to the picture because the, its metaphysical basis remains the same. It's just consumable properties all the way down. Okay, problem with this model, uh, it fails as well. Why? And uh, well, this is no uh, section five. So my main reason to claim that, that it fails and that we need to go beyond uh, this cognitive model is very simple, is that not the elements that pertain to the economic value of a culinary product, qua culinary product, fall uh, within the range of consumable properties, either in a restricted or in an extended sense. So here's the argument I intend to defend in this section. Just go through it. Uh, one, canary products have constitutive values, namely canary values. Two, uh, canary value is determined by consumable properties. If what makes a canary product valuable, qua canary product is determined by the value of the consumption experience that results from acquainted ways and discrimination of its consumable properties and consumable properties only. Three, there are instances of canary products whose canary value is determined at least in part independently of such consumable properties. Hence, uh, canary value is not and cannot be fully determined by consumable properties. So the key premises in this argument, I take it is premise three, and the way I'm going to defend it very easily is by means of example. Is by means of example. I'm going to give you two examples. One that concerns, again, uh, Gruyere cheese. I'm really sorry for sticking with that example, but uh, I can actually see the terroir of Gruyere cheese by looking through the window, so it's a very well-fitting one. And the other example I'm going to give you is one that uh, is from a modernist cuisine and, uh, and the recipe from, from, uh, from uh, Adrian Ferrer. Okay, so the first example relies on the distinction between, uh, so Gruyere is a cheese from Switzerland that has a geographical indication. And a part of, as part of this geographical indication, you have some minimal uh, uh, requirements you need to meet in order to be a genuine piece or authentic piece of, of, of Gruyere cheese. But within these uh, requirements, there are still uh, uh, very different ways to produce uh, Gruyere cheese. One way to produce it, which is very, uh, very peculiar and that's still being done, is uh, what we call Gruyere d'Alpage. So it's basically Gruyere that's being done during the summer on the Alps when the, the farmers, you know, they go up the Alps with their cows and they stay there for three or four months. They never come down or very rarely and they just stay there and produce cheese. And in some cases, it's still amazing because it's, they stay there in this very small hut and every morning they light up a fire and they produce a cheese basically in the way it was being produced 500 years ago. Um, now, the other way, there's another way, uh, if you want that, that's if, if, if we take the way to produce Gruyere the kind of spectrum, these are on one side of the spectrum, the other side of the spectrum would be big uh, quasi or fully industrial uh, uh, cheese factories where everything is being done in a way that's, that's very high-level. 
So what I want to say is that uh, there are some differences between the uh, piece of the, the an authentic piece of Gruyere and what I'm going to call a piece of an authentic piece of Gruyere that's also authentically made, and that's going to be the one of the kind like Gruyere Delta. So what are the differences? Well, there are differences in consumable properties in a restricted sense, of course. Why? Because the two cheeses are, are being done with very different kinds of, uh, of uh, grasses. So uh, the resulting taste of the cheeses is very different. There are also uh, different, uh, uh, differences in the consumable properties in an extended sense, because if you have the right concepts, you might, able, you might be able to track uh, uh, the relevant uh, uh, difference in, say, the intention of the cheese maker or the expression of the terroir between the two kinds of, of cheeses. But as I want to say that there is a difference that pertains to current value or through the current value between these two cheeses, but uh, uh, um, uh, 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 that is not restricted to these consumable properties, whether in a restricted or in an extended sense. And the idea is, there is that the distinction between being an authentic Gruyere and being an authentic Gruyere that's authentically made is, not, is, is a difference that pertains to the culinary value of the cheese and it's not a consumable property. Why? Because what we mean here by being authentically made is being made by someone that intends to uh, uh, implement or may manifest in the piece of cheese certain valuable features that are not consumable. For instance, uh, you know, uh, uh, respecting the principles of small scale agriculture, uh, living in some kind of proximity to the animals and to the landscape, uh, implementing some kind of self-reliance where you know, you're there on, the, uh, on your own doing this cheese, so on and so forth. And what I wanna say is that it seems that such values, first of all, they're not consumable properties, but they're also features of the cheese that you can reasonably see as bearing on your choice for one cheese rather than the other as a culinary product. So this would be my first defense of premise three. Second defense, I'm going to go uh, a bit quicker there is, is, is Adrian Sferra. He has, a, he has, a, he has a, a, an example of a recipe which he calls liquid chicken. So it's basically a chicken served in a liquid form with a sauce served into a solid form. The idea here is to say, you could imagine it's, uh, it's counterpart where the, the two things are inversed. You have chicken in a solid form and, 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 and sauce in the liquid form. There are gonna be differences between these two things. Of course, in terms of the consumable properties in a restricted sense, taste is going to be different. In consumable properties in an extended sense, yeah, maybe you, if, you, if you have the right concept of being that kind of sauce, you can track an intention of the cook, for instance. But uh, I also want, want to say that there are going to be differences in the, in the values of these two recipes and their instances that are not going to be restrict, uh, that are not going to be uh, uh, reducible to, to consumable properties. For instance, they're being surprising and they're being uh, satirical. These are really not consumable properties. Now, just a, a way to, 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 to avoid an objection here, someone could say, but look, uh, we know other cases where you have elements of satire, of, 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 of surprise and, and, and satire, where these are based on consumable properties. For instance, think of a dish that looks exactly like something uh, uh, savory and you taste it and it tastes salty. Uh, it tastes sweet, sorry. So you might say, well, look, there's an element here that's uh, of surprise and of satire, and this is based on the consumable properties of the dish, the way it tastes. It seems to me that the case of the, the liquid chicken is a bit different because actually, you know, tasting it is a bit not really required to have the element of satire and the element of, of surprise. So the, the dish could merely be served and you could look at it and say, well, uh, oh, nice, I see, funny. And you can have a canary value that's being attached to it quite independently of anything that's related to a sensory experience. Okay, the conclusion from this is that uh, there are canary products that uh, have features that can determine the canary value, 
and that these don't fall within the unions of the nutri nutritional properties and the consumable properties. Okay, here is a straightforward objection to this. The objection is just to say, yeah, of course, they have value valuable features that, like this, but such features don't impinge on the culinary value of these products. They bear on something else, whatever it is. And my rejoinder here is going to say, uh, the problem is that there's no way to establish this objection without actually begging the question of the nature of culinary value. Indeed, what the objection requires is not merely lo the logical possibility that we can distinguish between uh, canary value and other values and say, look, since we have this distinction, why do you claim that it's canary value? It could be other kind of values. Of course, something more is required for the objection to go through. A good story that's non-question begging that these features cannot be uh, features of canary value and must be features of another kind of value. And what I'm going to claim is that there is no such non-question making story to give. Okay, um, here is the argument. Compare artistic value with culinary value and think about a case where someone wants to track artistic value and wants method, at least in part, is to determine the investment value of an artwork and then to factor in this investment value as part of the artistic value of the artwork. Sort of, you know, complete Philistine about, about artworks. And what we want to say here is that there is no way this can work. You know, we know what, what artistic value is somehow. I mean, we're not very clear about it, but we know enough about it to know that it's not something like investment value. And we know enough about investment value to know that it doesn't impinge on, on artistic value. So the position we are here now is, is to say that, that we can rule out right from the start someone who would say investment value is part of, of, of artistic value. Someone who is doing this, we know right from the start is missing the point of artworks. Now, think about the parallel case where someone, for instance myself, would say, uh, with respect to culinary products, their culin culinary value can be determined at least in part by non-consumable features. Now, it seems to me that at this point, you cannot say really in a way that's not non-question begging, poor Patrick, he doesn't get it. Why? I mean, it seems here that the notion of culinary value is really up for grabs and that the main reason one could have to actually make that move is endorsing one of the two models I, 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 uh, I discussed before. But that's the very question whether these two models really are, are the right points. So I think at this point, uh, someone who is a proponent of these two models cannot really make this objection. The best the person can do is to say, okay, let's wait for what you have to propose. And then we sort of make, you know, uh, 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 we sort of discuss once we have everything on the table. And my strategy here is to say, once you allow me to put everything on the table, I hope to be able to convince you that you're not entitled to that objection. Okay. Um, this uh, leads me to, uh, to discuss uh, 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 what, I, what is the, 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 the last model of canary value that I want to discuss, what I call the encompassing model of uh, canary value. This is section six on the, on the handout. So the alternative model uh, basically rejects the central assumption, which is shared by both the hedonic model and the cognitive enhanced model, namely that current value is entirely determined by nutritional and consumable properties, whether these are uh, understood in a strict or in an extended sense. And I'm going to develop here, I mean, there are probably different ways to develop such a model, but here I'm going to embrace a particular way to develop that model. I'm going to develop a two-step model of canary value, uh, where at the first step, we're going to say that canary products can have first order values. For instance, they can have a consumption value, they can have a cognitive value, they can have an existent, existential value like self-reliance or manifest an existential value like self-reliance. 
And as a second step, we can say that canary value is a, is a second order value that's being determined or constituted by these first order values. So uh, as a matter of fact, there is a similar model for artistic value that's being developed by uh, a stacker. And there was a bit of a blow for me because I thought about this and I was like, oh, this is a cool idea. And I realized it already existed on the market because I wanted to develop it also for artistic value. So anyway, uh, for details, uh, uh, and actually I think there are important differences between, between aesthetic value and canary value as some other values. I'm not gonna go too much into this, but in any case, you can look at the book by Stecker, which is a very nice book. Okay, so here is the official formulation of this uh, uh, encompassing model. Canary products have first order values, such as consumption value, cognitive value, or existential value. But they can also have a distinct kind of value, canary value, which is a second order kind of value that's being determined by these first order values. Accordingly, some uh, canary products have more canary value than others, not only because they can have more value of the same kind, for instance, more hedonic value, or more hedonic value somewhat cognitively penetrating. Uh, they can have more value because they have more values of different kinds. For instance, in the case of the two pieces of cheese, the uh, authentic piece of Gruyere and the authentic piece of Gruyere authentically made, one has more culinary value because it has more values. It has, for instance, it manifests existential values as self-reliance in the way the other does not. Okay, uh, now I'm going to discuss three objections to this, uh, to this encompassing model. And by way of answering these objections, I hope to make it a bit more uh, clear and substantial. So I'm going to read these objections because I think they are, they are quite, uh, they are quite uh, uh, it's, it's better to have them clearly in mind. Okay, I start with objection one, it's point, uh, 6.5 on the handout. Um, and, and, and here, if you want these three objections, the way they're gonna work is to say that we can have a good grasp on a value like artistic value being a second order value in the case of artistic value, but we don't have such a good grasp in the case of canary value. Hence, the move of treating canary value as a second order value is not a good one. That's going to be the sort of general strategy I'm going to, to, to rebuke. So objection one, in the case of art, even though artistic value is determined by multiple disjoint first order values, for instance, you can have an output that says, you know, it is aesthetically pleasing, it's creative, and it has, uh, 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 make, makes a political statement. These are completely disjoint values. And you're going to say, well, somehow together these values, they uh, make artistic value. But even though they are disjoint and, 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 and quite, you know, uh, quite, they don't have much to do with each other, there's a good sense in which we can unite them as being determiners of, of, of artistic value. So we can nonetheless, uh, so in the case of, of this uh, artistic value, we can, there's these multiple disjoint first order values, but we can nonetheless identify something that we might call an artistic focus or function that the realization of these artworks aim for. And accordingly, we have an understanding of artistic value as being an evaluation of the way an artwork can be said to realize this focus of function, such that the more it is able to do so, the more artistic value it possesses. However, in the case of canary products, we would be quite at loss to identify such a common canary focus or function that multiple disjoint first order values could nonetheless be said to realize. And without such a notion, the encompassing model has no plausibility as without it, the first order value is supposed to determine canary value would just amount to a disparate collection of values. The best we can do here to have a sense of unification is to fall back on either the hedonic model or the cognitive model and have things like, for instance, existential values being more adventitious add-ons to the overall value of canary products. I think well, I'm going to discuss uh, 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 this, uh, a second version of this objection because I think that as it stands, this objection is not good. And the, the rejoinder is very easy is, what the heck 
is an artistic focus of function. I mean, make a quick list of artworks from, uh, I don't know, from uh, 15th century, or if you like it to be part of the finance tradition, 17th century till right now. Take 20 of them, and some of them quite extreme, and tell me what's the common focus of function there. And it's quite difficult to do this. So the idea is here, this, this, this objection is kind of using a notion that, uh, you know, it's not really legit. But that's okay because I'm going to discuss this objection in a way that's a bit more uh, careful now. So we can say there is one thing that all these works have in common, artworks that have in common, despite their variety of focuses, namely the fact that they are all part of a historically determined practice that we call art and that they all have been produced and received as part of this tradition. Maybe we can say anything very substantial about what unifies uh, uh, the works that fall within this tradition, maybe just hold on to some kind of tautological statement of the kind, uh, this is art because this is art, or some kind of very long disjunction of the form, X is art if it is F, F prime, F double prime, so on and so forth, and just a you know, historically open statement there. And, and, uh, and, and the sense of unification, of, unif of unification really comes from standing in the tradition. And the idea is that an explanation of what explains the common focus or, or function of artworks uh, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry, the idea here is to say we might have this for artworks, this sense of tradition. We don't have it for culinary works or culinary products. So we cannot really unify culinary products and the notion of culinary value through that notion of tradition. Here I'm going to say, well, you know what? This is not true. This is just not true. And uh, there is a notion of canary tradition that's similar to the one of artistic tradition. And it is notable that as part of this tradition, the very notions of canary product and the notion of canary value have, have been discussed and challenged in pretty much the same way uh, it has been the case with respect to artistic uh, value. And here, uh, I, mean, I have a paper on this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, uh, make a summary of the paper, but just think about the case of Adrian Ferra making this liquid chicken in, uh, uh, I mean, it's clear that he's there challenging some notion of canary product and some notion of canary value. That's part of a tradition. So you have a sense here of, we don't know exactly what's going on, but you have a sense of some people being part of a tradition and talking with each other. So we could unify, I think in pretty much the same, we could unify in pretty much the same way we unify artworks and artistic value by the notion of tradition, the notion of canary uh, product and the notion of canary value. Okay, still there's another objection. And this objection is, I think it's the most important one. And it goes as follows, is to say that even though there might be some notion of canary tradition, that's on the par with the one of artistic tradition, it's a fact that canary products, unlike artworks, are so much unified by the fact that they are consumables and so little unified by something else that a conception of canary value as a second order value along the lines advocated by the encompassing model seems impossible to countenance. The idea here is to say, well, look, even though you might have people like, like Ferrar, you know, who tried to do this kind of stuff, in the end, this is all consumables and the only value they have is only consumable property. So you're gonna, not gonna get out of the woods there. I think this objection can already be challenged on the grounds that I've been, uh, on, on some of the claims I made before, but I'm going to try to, to answer to that objection now in, in a different way. The rejoinder is the following, and then I'm done with the paper, don't worry. So the rejoinder is the, is the following. I think that in the culinary domain, just as much as in the artistic domain, we should be able to make a distinction between what I call the medium and what is achieved through that medium. I think in the case of art, it's a pretty standard uh, distinction. Indeed, we generally distinguish between an artistic medium and what is being achieved through that medium. And in the case of art, what's remarkable is that there are a lot of these mediums or media. You know, there's things that can be looked at, 
uh, as standard pictures, as photographic pictures, you have movies, you have things you can read, things you can touch, so on and so forth. It's very, and things you can only thought, think about, for instance, in the case of conceptual art, so on and so forth. But somehow we have the idea that all these works of art, independently of their media and the variety of the media, they all try to do something which is similar. There is something which is an artistic aim, whatever that is, that they all try to achieve. Now, when I say that there is no such diversity in the case of canary products, as of course, all canary products must be consumables. But I think that this doesn't mean that we cannot distinguish between a culinary product as a medium and what is being achieved for that medium. And I think that the, 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 the restriction of uh, that, the, so the objection, this objection claims that there is a restriction that's intrinsic to uh, uh, culinary products. I think this restriction applies only to culinary products as a medium and not to culinary products as the kind of things we can do through that medium. And once we have a good understanding of the distinction, then we can see how multiple first order values can be realized through a same medium being a consumable in a way that allow us to speak of canary value in terms of a second order, second order value. Um, okay, so in what sense not at that point, six, the 611 on the, on the handout. Uh, in what sense can we get a grip on what is being achieved through the culinary medium in a way that this doesn't fall back on what is, what is captured by the, the hedonic model and, the, and the, 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 the cognitive enhanced model? So the idea here is to say, someone could say, look, I grant you the distinction between culinary product as a medium and canary product in the sense of what is being achieved through that medium. But this doesn't yet mean that what is being achieved through that medium doesn't uh, reduce to the kind of values that are advocated by the hedonic model and the cognitive lens model. So you still have to tell me a bit more about how uh, this would uh, get you out of the woods into your idea of you could have of, of your out of the woods in the light of your defense of canary value as a second order value. And I think here is an interesting way to look at, at this problem that I, I, I find myself quite uh, convincing. The idea is that in the case of artworks, artworks often constitute a special avenue or a special opportunity to materialize certain values or certain concerns, whether these are aesthetic, cognitive, emotional, moral, political, or whatever else. That is, in addition to the notion of tradition, we also get a sense of a, a sense of unification of the domain of artworks as these things that constitute a special avenue or opportunity to materialize certain values. And one very condensed way to express this is to say that often what we might call the form artwork bears a very tight fit with the content artwork, in a sense that. You look at an artwork, you might be challenged to say what it is that makes, makes it an artwork, but you might still recognize that in the light of what the artist wanted to do, doing this via an artwork was the right thing to do. So uh, in the light of this tight fit, then we can see how artistic value can be a function from disjoint and unrelated first order values. So if someone wanted to do something that's good to look at, innovative and has political, uh, makes a political statement, then doing an artwork was doing the right thing. Now, I think a similar thing can be said about culinary products and culinary value. One might think that with respect to some first order values, for instance, self-reliance or sensory acquaintance with past living conditions or the mediation of a relation to the environment, one would be hard pressed to find a better form than the culinary form to express that content. So in the light of this, we can say that a, some, in some cases, there's a tight fit between the form culinary product and some first order value. 
such that we can understand why multiple and these disjoint first order values can be regarded as determining canary value conceived as a sum of order value. So I'll just leave you here with an example. Um, imagine someone producing authentic Gruyere cheese in, an authentic, in, in, a, in, in a way that's authentic, cheese that authentically made. And this person could tell you, uh, I do this because I want to do something that's tasty, that expresses the terroir, but that also expresses an existential value like self-reliance. And there is no way I can do these three things, but in a way of producing this cheese. And this should you give you a sense of unification of these first order values as being able to constitute this second order value. And this, I think, gives you a sense of why and how canary value should be conceived as a second order, second order value that has, that has determiners which go beyond values that are determined by nutritional and consumable properties. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for this rich and articulated uh, paper. I'm sure we'll have uh, quite a bit of, um, of discussion. Maybe we should take a, a few minutes break. We can uh, end the recording here. Maybe I take this moment to